The Cube at Hadoop Summit 2014 is brought to you by anchor sponsor Hortonworks. We do Hadoop. And headline sponsor, WAN Disco. We make Hadoop invincible. Okay, welcome back everyone live in Silicon Valley. This is Hadoop Summit 2014. I'm John Furrier, the founder of SiliconAngle.com. Here with leading big data analyst Jeff Kelly with Wikibon.org. And our next guest is Inhee Chu with IBM, big data, vice president uh, in charge of all the big data activities. Great to see you again inside theCUBE. Thanks, John. I know you John. got an official title, I should know it by heart by now, but it's, it's all good. so official, it's like so <laughs> long. Um, welcome back. A lot of things involved, thank you. I'm actually excited to be here and happy we're uh, seeing you outside of Vegas. <laughs> I know, we have a lot of fun in Vegas, but the air gets dry in my throat. As you it can does, tell. it does. Um, so what are you doing here? You guys have a booth apparently, so you're in the trenches. <laughs> we are you know, in the trenches. Bob with the open source community. Tell us what's yeah, happening. Uh, we're in the Hadoop space, surprise, surprise. Um, you know what's interesting is just, I would say the growth. I mean, Merv did such a good job in the opening uh, keynote this morning about realistically where clients are. Um, I think for sure um, everyone's experimenting with uh, Hive and HBase. I think in terms of Spark and some of the other areas like Yarn, I mean there's tremendous um, contribution but it's still relatively immature relative to kind of where, where the audience is and where the skill base is. Um, I think SQL was an interesting discussion about SQL on top. Um, I think the other thing that's been growing, at least in terms of my discussions, is really about understanding the entity. You know, who's who, and what context, and what persona, uh, and then the security. Uh, security is a hot topic mm. for everybody. So you know, I want to say yeah. it's fun to watch <coughs> Hadoop grow up, and that was Merv and I was on the cube earlier. We're talking yeah. with Jeff, really breaking down where we are in the evolution. And you know, one thing that we've done with you guys at IBM is we've always been to your conferences where you guys are fluent in the word business outcome. I mean, you have a lot <laughs> of big customers of a legacy business. Oh, yeah. Um, but that's new words for the Hadoop ecosystem because you're seeing a massive acceleration of mainstream adoption for oh, Hadoop yeah. as a platform for big data in a variety of diverse use cases. While in general the platform's still immature in some areas, security obviously seeing the M&A work. Absolutely. So how do you guys look at that? IBM's looking down from the balcony on the stage of the Hadoop ecosystem, you have a lot of experience. How are you guys engaging and contributing in that community? You know, I, I will tell you a few things. I thought one of the things Herb said, um, Merv said in his session that was interesting was, you know, you're going from POC to production, production to platform. Platform is when you're really thinking about holistically the architecture and how you extend out. Uh, you know, that's a mindset that is core to like our DNA right, at IBM. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, you, you can't even begin to uh, 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 leave, uh, let's say, kind of the innovation around how we build the technology, how the team really thinks through, how the client's going to adopt it without thinking about the outcome first. Um, now, in terms of the contributions, I think our contribution right now has just been partly educating, uh, much like uh, many of the other contributors, educating more the broader industry about the value and then extending some of the enterprise capability. So security, integration governance has been a big portion for us. Um, things like understanding the metadata piece, mm -hmm. I mean, we started to add metadata cataloging capabilities within uh, not only uh, big insights, but also in terms of the way you catalog that um, enabling security over structured SQL type data stores, but also NoSQL and Hadoop, uh, and really thinking about how to optimize various jobs. I mean, th this whole space is so exciting. Is the SQL stuff going to take hold or what? I mean, it's the year Absolutely. of SQL again. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so we're really excited. We are actually delivering uh, um, this month, and we have a beta program going on right now around what's called a Big SQL, a Big SQL 3.0, and we actually have a session tomorrow at 3.30 on it. Um, and it's really taking a, you know, SQL to a whole new level. Um, we've done some internal testing on it. I will tell you this is probably the most advanced SQL that'll be here in the marketplace. You know, the thing that gets me excited about the SQL is we were just talking earlier about some of the Actian guys about some of the voodoo science at the high end of the spectrum. There's yeah. a lot of, we look at parallel processing for instance, there's a lot of black art magic that, <laughs> that very few people can code. So whether it's data science or high end parallel processing, the computer science is very advanced and not a lot of people can actually do that, so the, the talent gap will never be solved because it's just too hard. Well, you know, that point on the talent gap real quick, um, the U.S. Labor Department actually did a, a recent announcement that there's going to be like 170,000 more 
uh, data jobs um, in the next two years, meaning incrementally around analytics, uh, data architects, data scientists, data modelers, and um, this is a huge growth increase, and like you said, there aren't enough skilled practitioners that actually know some of the new technology bases mm -hmm. and some of the new query languages and some of the declarative languages, especially for like text analytics or machine learning. And so SQL is um, great on two dimensions. One is the skill set. There's plenty of SQL um, knowledgeable uh, professionals in the marketplace. But the second reason is actually performance. I mean, if you really look at what clients are also putting on Hadoop, it includes SQL data and, and a lot of log analysis. Mm -hmm. And so if you want to start to improve some of that performance and, and also do it across, you know, um, I think the term here a lot of people have talked about was data lake or data re reservoir. Mm -hmm. you, you know, SQL's going to be a huge accelerator to that. Well, you know, it's interesting that they, uh, you know, the government points out we're going to create this, you know, 170,000 more yeah. data-related jobs. But really, if you think about it, most knowledge workers are becoming data professionals in, in, yeah, a, in yeah. a lot of ways. I mean, you've got to understand how to interpret data, how to communicate with data, and that's you know one of the one of the softer problems, one of the non-technology problems. I think a lot of organizations run into is kind of getting people to buy into this, hey, you've got to start taking into account um, you know, real data and real insights. What does IBM do to kind of help with some of those more cultural so, challenges? Well, we've been talking about um, kind of three things actually at an enterprise transformation level. So one is about how do you build an analytic-driven culture? Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that we've been tracking over the last two years is also the increase of what's called a chief data officer. Mm -hmm. I've actually had the opportunity to meet several. Um, this includes like you know uh, various banks like Bank of America, SunTrust Bank, Fidel, um, uh, uh, BB and T. You know, sort of a range as well as uh, uh, insurance companies as well as healthcare companies, um, especially those that are in that bridge of managing everything from operations to risk to uh, really thinking about the strategic importance of data. Mm -hmm. uh, who's using it? How's it being used? How often is it being used? Um, who's doing things that are unexpected? Are we getting the value that we expect out of it? Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of an emerging class, and one of the things that we started to do was actually start to interview and create a community around the new category of chief data officer, so that's one. The second piece we're also doing is actually working with um, several universities uh, globally to mm -hmm. actually put together a curriculum, both in the uh, business school as well as in the uh, technical schools uh, for certifications and advanced sort of master's classes um, around various data type jobs, and we've been tracking actually the jobs uh, uh, that have been published in the in the US markets and some European markets. So I would say that's probably been going on, that's pretty big. And then I just got back from Israel as well as uh, Kuala Lumpur in mm -hmm. Malaysia the last two weeks. And um, there's a huge push also around open data, right? So mm. publicly available data. So it's uh, it's been really interesting to see kind of the national frameworks that are developing by country, um, and government, as well as uh, even um, uh, private sector. Talk yeah. about the globalization impact, because that's a really good point. I want to drill down on that. We tend not to talk about that much, but I was on a panel um, um, at VMware with Mark Andreessen, oh, Stanford yep. University, founder of FireEye, uh, David DeWalt, all these guys. I, mean, I was on that panel, I was actually <laughs> watching the panel. Joe Tucci was there, I wasn't on a panel, I was actually there. You should have, have my, been on the panel. I don't have my A game. First of all, CNBC was moderating, did a horrible job. If I was you should moderating, have been on the they, no, they did a good job. Um, <laughs> but the, the globalization came in as a big point because two things. One, opportunity for new uh, products, but oh, yeah. market expansion yeah. for companies. And also the infrastructure is different in each country. So oh how do you gosh, look at absolutely. that? How do you, is it true, do you agree? Oh yeah, yeah. You know, so culture, so one thing is, so I, you know, coming from Israel uh, recently, one of the things that I found really interesting about um, the country was a huge focus around startup. So we actually just launched IBM along with um, several other companies, and they're not necessarily technology companies, they're actually enterprise companies, mm -hmm. um, around a uh, startup accelerator in the marketplace because it's a huge outgrowth really from, uh, you know, uh, I would say, it, it's an interesting skill set that everyone has to go through the military, especially mm -hmm. there's some advanced training that's done around technology as an example. There's a huge investment flux because of a variety of reasons. There's a nice cultural linkage in terms of appreciation of analytics and data. And so you see advancements in that way. Um, you see other countries also advancing depending on different aspects, language, 
uh, uh, degree of certain industries being more dominant, whether it's telecommunications, retail, energy, healthcare. Uh, but you know what's the most amazing thing is like the transparency of the use cases. So if one team in one country sees what's possible that another business mm -hmm. did in another country, yeah, they could be his, you know, technically a year behind or two years behind in terms of the questions that they were asking, but in terms of how quickly they, once they learn it, they can implement it, they become uh, very agile very quickly. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and, and, and uh, some of the telco carriers, especially in uh, some of the growth markets, are much more advanced because they're thinking in terms of the wireless structure, they're not, you know, um, mm -hmm. they don't have some of the traditional wired lines. And so back to some of the industry trends, I want to ask you about EDW and Hadoop. Some say that it's a complement, where the survey that Jeff developed yeah. is showing quite the opposite, that Hadoop is becoming a replacement in the mind of, I think that was well, kind of... Uh, well, I, I don't know if I'd go that far, okay. but <laughs> anyway, ask the, ask the question and then I'll... Okay, you can I'll, clarify. I'll interject, but... But, but in general, what truly is complementary in a disruptive market? So I want to get your perspective on that. Where does Hadoop fit in that? Because you guys have a lot of commercial products. Yeah. But IBM is very committed to open source with the IBM Pulse event oh and gosh. Impact. And it's Apache obvious. in general. I mean, beyond just Hadoop. But Hadoop is one of the core uh, open source project areas, but uh, our commitment to open source is pretty strong. Historically <laughs> and even today. Um. <laughs> so well, what we're finding is, uh, you know, of those who have implemented yeah. Hadoop, about 60% have shifted one workload or another from an EDW to Hadoop. So it's not replacing the entire data warehouse, but you know they are being uh, strategic about which But uh, there's a shift happening. Let, oh, let me rephrase. There's so certainly there's, a shift. There's, yeah. there's not a massive shift, but there's some shifting going on. You know right. what I would call it? I, I'd actually call it kind of two steps. So the mm -hmm. first step is streamline. Right? And streamlining because one is a cost is a huge driver. Yeah, I mean cost per terabyte of managing, leveraging Hadoop is significantly lower. So you, you can't get away from the math. So the math says, yeah, why wouldn't you consider it? The second piece is about platform modernization. The types of data sets that people actually want to start to understand are varied. And it's not necessarily completely unstructured yet. Um, mm -hmm. But it's more what I consider like semi-structured data, mm -hmm. and that's why you see a lot of log analysis because it's questions people wanted to ask and discover, but you still don't see Hadoop fully in production at the scale that you see relational systems fully in production for the same reason, which is about, you know, currently maturity, backup recovery, mm -hmm. archive, uh, security aspects, yep. redundancy, scale, all, all these things, and, and um, uh, many companies are really excited about the opportunity, but it's also about timing. Um, and I can't, you know, there's also another business philosophy. You, you rarely uh, want to, let's say, break or move or stop something that's actually working well, right? Mm -hmm. So that's why I use the word kind of streamline what you need and then really think about how do you modernize to really capture kind of the new workload. Yeah, I mean, as a CIO, you really got to be kind of a portfolio manager and, yeah. and, and, and manage the transition um, and really pick the right tool for the right job. Oh, yeah. But you've got to live, you, you live in the real world. It's not, you're not, the vast majority of IBM customers are not starting with a blank slate. That's They've right. Got, you know, a lot and of I've investment seen, in other technologies, so. Well, and I've actually seen mistakes on both extremes, quite honestly. I've seen mm -hmm. some clients that have moved almost too much to Hadoop and actually, as a result, have lost their jobs because they weren't thinking realistically about the implications of what that meant. Mm -hmm. All the way to the other extreme where you know, some haven't been as proactive as they need. Mm -hmm. They need to be a lot more aggressive and really thinking about modernizing that environment or being more aggressive about the skill set on their team. So, you you know, you never want to be on either end. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, um, but I would say most of the market is doing a fairly good job. I mean, my preference is that we have more vendors, more contributors, more uh, technology and more client use. So you know? what's your focus area for your M&A strategy? Can you share with us uh, who you're looking at? <laughs> No. <laughs> <laughs> okay, next question. Okay. Um, of course, I knew you wanted to an answer, but that's always asked the questions. Oh, the answer well, you know what? I, here's how I think about it, just quite honestly. <clears throat> so even if you look at IBM's investment, I'll be very frank. We invest a tremendous amount internally on organic development. So on the order of, of um, probably about three to four billion just in the information and analytics space alone on an annual basis. And that's on our own internal development. And then we probably have spent I would say over the last uh, five years, on average, somewhere around three to four billion every year on <laughs> of various acquisitions in the information analytics space. Mm -hmm. So our strategy is really about, okay, how do we enable, and I'm going to use the word outcome again, 
how do we enable true outcome and solution transformational kind of solutions for our clients? And to do that, you've got to have a spectrum of understanding of the industry dimension, you've got to have a spectrum of understanding of, of the use case, the adoption, and, mm -hmm. and it means it's a combination of capabilities, and we recognize some of it's going to be developed organically, and some of it that so we want to go. So the three to four billion you mentioned on the analytics side, is that R&D and acquisition money, or, two, or just R&D internally? R&D internally. And then the acquisition budget is? is another three to four that we've okay, spent. Yeah. So, yeah. so, so it, you're, you're 50, looking at 50. almost, yeah, 50-50 and almost probably somewhere in the order of seven That's to eight billion on, a, on an annual basis. Yeah, I mean, I think most people are surprised. We, we rarely talk about it in all those things, but you can actually see it very clearly hmm. through our um, investor kind of yeah. materials and, and well, our Well, you just filings. shared it. We're happy that yeah. we get that data out there. I just put it on the crowd chat. <laughs> um, so we are here at uh, Hadoop Summit, so I yeah. want to talk a little bit about uh, IBM's approach to Hadoop specifically. Yeah. So, can you talk a little bit about big insights? Uh, what kind of traction you're seeing in the market? I mean, obviously there's a lot of coverage of kind of the, the startup community and the horse race between Cloudera and Hortonworks, but of course IBM's got their own distribution and you've got the other pieces that you layer on top. We do. Explain a little bit uh, to the people out there what kind of what the approach is, and, and talk about the traction you're getting in the market. So, uh, you know, first of all, I, it, this is also an evolution that's been happening. I mean, if you think about the Hadoop Summit, it's it started in what, 2006 time frame, 2008? time frame and sort of the evolution, one of the things we've been conscious about is really how, how does it augment kind of the client's environment and the enterprise. And so a lot of our contribution has been really focused on kind of readying it for the enterprise. So mm -hmm. how do you manage the workload? How do you handle kind of some of the more advanced analytics, right? So we've been probably pushing the, what I would consider pushing the boundaries around the advanced analytics. So MDM, big match, meaning how do you take the probabilistic matching capabilities that are historically in relational systems and enable that paralyzed over a Hadoop as a way to actually be able to correlate structured you know, mm -hmm. entities as well as unstructured entities and have tremendous insight. Another aspect would be things like um, security. You know, we were probably the first uh, to deliver SQL uh, as well as NoSQL security capabilities across the spectrum from you know, identifying, accessing sensitive information, masking it, to um, uh, auditing and log tracking, to monitoring and activity to encryption. You know, so the full spectrum is something that we've been thinking about because we want it to be adopted. Mm -hmm. And in order for it to be adopted, we, you have to think about the enterprise perspective in order for businesses that are in really, you know, have a high level of accountability, fiduciary duty, quite quite honestly, mm -hmm. uh, to their consumers and their businesses that they support. Talk about some of the trends in big data that you're involved in. You and I were yeah. talking before we came on camera about streaming that you and I both oh, are getting yeah. really excited by. <laughs> um, because there's new forms of data. I'll see post 9-11 had a whole requirement about Homeland Security. You're seeing video surveillance. I think we talked about that one time. Yeah. Facial recognition going into the cloud. It's just like Watson's being a big part of that. So what oh, do you get yeah. jazzed about? What gets you excited? <laughs> You know what, uh, it's really about reimagining, I mean, I, I kid you not, it's really about reimagining kind of the entire business differently and the way we work and operate differently. Mm -hmm. I, so I'll give you a simple streams example that has just been unbelievable just this last year. And we've been talking about this, but the scale of it is we've been working in a lot of um, medical hospitals around intensive care unit monitoring, whether that's neonatal, whether it's um, intensive care units, post-major traumatic surgeries, whether it's in uh, general emergency rooms. And what it is is, I look at it as the ability to not only be able to process, like a single patient generates, I mean, I kid you not, a single patient could generate like 100,000 data points per minute, right? That's a lot of data for mm -hmm. the, the medical staff to even process before they even diagnose what's wrong with the patient. By the time they figure it out, it's almost too late or they, they've lost sort of that lead time. And if you can process all of that in real time, you can actually prevent something. I mean, that's like giving people time to save lives. I mean, you're almost figuring out a way to stop the clock in that moment to prevent, mm -hmm. I mean, it, it just, it, prevent fatalities, I mean, prevent, um, uh, you know, progression in, into various cancer forms. I think that's, pe you know, operating much more in real time is going to be exciting because it's not just about operating in terms of processing and accessing that information. It's like the analytic applications, the interactions, the visuals are going to be much more in real time. Mm -hmm. um, uh, video analysis is huge. Image analysis, I mean, these are things that we're really advancing the needle on. Um, text to voice analysis, streaming voice analysis. Um, these are things uh, I'm excited about. We've actually done a few uh, scenarios around video analysis 
as well, so. What's your take on the Hadoop ecosystem relative to its maturity, Given put an inning on it if you can. Third inning, fifth inning, late uh, innings? Oh, you know what? I, I would say definitely, probably, in, I, I would say third third inning. I mean, we're, we're still at such an early stage. I don't think there are enough, um, enough new applications that are written, quite honestly. And um, the thing is, I look at Hadoop as much as not only kind of a, a, a data management repository and, and set of capabilities, um, I really look at it as an analytic platform. So what you're really excited is about the new class of applications that can be written, leveraging Hadoop. And, um, and so that's why I feel like it's definitely at the early stages. Jeff, what's your take on it? Well, I think you know, the promise of Yarn is that you can now oh, build yeah. new types of, uh, well, new ways of processing data so you can build real-time applications. You can use machine learning, you should graph analysis, streaming, all different types uh, of uh, ways to process data, but you still got to build the apps. So you know, Yarn is, you know, it's yet another research, resource negotiator, but it's yet another enabler. It's not in and of itself the solution. You still got to build the applications, find the right business case, uh, you know, deliver applications that end users actually are going to use. So it's not a cure-all, it's a critical enabler. So my, my take is that you know, it's going to take a little bit of time for that to happen. I mean, Yarn's only been here for six months or so, or maybe a little bit longer. Um, you know, these things take time to develop. So uh, it's, it's fantastic that it's here, but I think it is going to take a while. Um, but, I, but I fully think it's those, when those applications start to come online and, and that the mainstream organizations are going to be much more likely to adopt uh, some of these technologies. Um, if you have to rely on internal developers to build your applications, um, you're not going to see the market kind of grow to the extent that we think it's going to. It's going to require some application uh, companies to come out and, uh, or big vendors or specific oh, startups and, to come and out and, and develop these applications. I think you're going to see a kind of a, um, a growth of new types of applications. Mm -hmm. So uh, geospatial location, so space and time dimensions to analytics is kind of really exciting to know, yeah. you know, people that are localized in certain areas, are they surfing the same mm -hmm. types of sites and do they frequent the same types of stores and are there certain affinities or understanding behavior while people are moving through time, right? Projecting and trajectory analysis yeah. of, of a person being and arriving at a certain spot at a certain time frame. Or, mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, you know, wearables are also increasing. The in terms wearable of conference is going on in San Francisco today. I have my friends up there from Factual, <coughs> Tyler Bell, and the Factual team and yeah. on data, data sets. Yeah. Is, whole new internet of things. Right? Absolutely, so, absolutely. I got to get your take on this. We were talking earlier with Merv about this one point and talking about some of these emerging startups, I won't say their name, um, <laughs> in San Francisco, um, but he said the quote, um, just because you put something in a bag doesn't make it a portfolio. Okay? Well said. Which is an old joke, right? But it means you can't, just because you put stuff in a, in a something doesn't mean it's actually cohesive. So I got to ask you the portfolio question. If you have the internet of things, yeah. you have big data, yes. there are many, 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 many use cases. So you guys have a portfolio. Some will argue, you know, some's better than enough and some are emerging, but you guys have a comp comprehensive portfolio. Yeah. Others are trying to replicate that. With all this diversity, how do you be successful as a portfolio business well. in the big data world? <laughs> It's a tough question. Um, so the big thing is really thinking about the client use cases and how the applications and the ecosystem's actually evolving. Mm -hmm. So when you think about a portfolio, we really think about what I consider kind of the, th the thread that weaves all these pieces together. Mm -hmm. And so, um, for example, you know, streaming and operating in real time is a great need, but that in of itself isn't the outcome. So for us to think about the internet of things, for example, you know, just saying you've got a horizontal platform to handle that isn't enough, right? The Internet of Things means the data, the definition of the data set, how you process it, difference between managing it on the grid, managing it for deep well analysis, mm -hmm. for oil rigs, or, or for digging and coal and mining is very different than aerospace defense analysis, mm -hmm. or yeah. very different than connected vehicles and cars, which is very different than agriculture, which is different than cities and intelligent transportation. So when you think about what does it mean when we say the in, uh, you know, internet of things, there's a lot of machine generated data as well as human generated data, and do you process it in a certain way that gets to that outcome? So mm -hmm. for us, it's really important to understand the set of 
connectors, the way you're going to analyze and yeah. process that data, the full context, meaning all the associated information around that, so you have the context and in a perspective of dimension, time, entity, as well as um, um, you know, what are the what are the data models? What are the algorithms? What are the unique customer experience? What's the level of the interaction you actually want to have? So I think about that full end-to-end -end dimension, and and, um, yeah, and no, quite okay. honestly, there's a huge, huge team of experts. So <laughs> well, you know, uh, it makes IBM, it easy. You guys have a lot of things going on, but <laughs> I, I, I watch like the Cloud Air's Enterprise Data Hub, which I really love that positioning. But it feels like they're pedaling as fast as they can, and just it's just so much energy. When in reality, you guys have the same concept with the hub, but you have Watson as cognitive computing on top of it. So, do you feel like you have an unfair advantage over the Clouderas of the world, who are positioning themselves as a data hub when it's just a tub of data at this point? It's infrastructure. I'm not and commenting. They, I mean, <laughs> you know what it is. I mean, is cognitive computing is essentially saying we're going to put reasoning on top of the data hub for extraction of real-time actual insights. That is the vision of what Cloud Air is saying. Well, you know, it, it's also kind of signaling kind of another shift that's happening in the technology dimension, right? So we went from what we call the tabulating era to the programmable era, and a lot of advancements in programming languages has been really process-driven. What we're saying is now programming languages are also evolving because of the nature of the data. Data is actually deciding what a process should be and what an mm -hmm. application should look like, which is fundamentally a different mindset. And then you get into cognitive, which is really about some of the human elements, like how do you how do you interact? How do you perceive? How do you reason? How do you trust? Um, it, 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 how do you remember things? How do you learn things? I, you know, it, it's a whole different whole different advancement. But I look at I I, I don't um, have quite the same view as the way you just described it because. The way I think about it is, um, it's an entire ecosystem of contributors yeah. that really enable the market shift. And I consider it like, um, you know well, what, I mean, all boats being, rise nice. when the tide nice. rises, right? Yeah. No, no, but you want the tide to rise. You know, you're being That's nice, we'll, we'll, we'll call it as it is. They're still <laughs> early and you're IBM 50 years with the mainframe under your belt. But um, the, I, this, I would say hands down, we understand the, the enterprise. There's, there's, no, no, there's no doubt there's about no that. There's no doubt about that, but Jeff, <laughs> Jeff just did a segment with Jay from SSB of Yahoo and some of the quotes coming in off the crowd chat were fantastic. Had Hortonworks stayed private, you wouldn't have seen all these other companies with tools coming out. So I bring this up with the Cloudera question because their vision has always been this way from day one. And even though they're small and growing compared to IBM, you guys have a dominant advantage over them, that competition is always good because no matter what, if yeah, Cloudera wasn't drives pushing innovation. their yeah. agenda and Hortonworks didn't have their open source uh, mojo, <laughs> You wouldn't have all this new innovation. That's right, innovation. it's true, it's true. So, do you feel that uh, the innovation is hot right now? How would you, what would you look at in oh, the landscape? Yeah. What do you point at and say, that's hot innovation? What's the, what's the one thing that you point to right now that says that in your mind is the, the um, big innovation push? You know, the, uh, so first of all, I think right now data is sexy, so it, pretty much anything in the data and analytics space is fairly hot. <laughs> um, I think uh, uh, Forbes even announced last year that it was like the uh, one of the sexiest jobs to have if you had a data title, big data or analytics type title, um, <laughs> which I found interesting. Um, <laughs> hey, storage was sexy once, now data is sexy, storage, data, kissing cousins who, who kind knows, of thing. Who knows, who knows, it's all related I guess. Um, but honestly it's like what, what clients get excited about when you can say it empowers uh, kind of new work to be done, it empowers people to have access, it empowers a completely different interactive experience, it empowers a whole new level of insight, and I think that's what drives innovation is it makes us pause and rethink about the possibilities. Rethink the possibilities on all dimensions. The business model, some of you know, the disrupted business models are amazing. Um, think about new roles and emerging roles that you, know, you, you didn't have some of these jobs 10 years ago, or even five years ago, or three years ago. Uh, to uh, things like um, operating in completely different ways that are going to be you know, transformative for, for society, not just for business, but really genuinely for people. Yeah, I mean yeah. the possibilities are, are just tremendous. I mean there is, a, there is a, a 
kind of a, a, um, a journey that has to be taken. I mean, there are there are going to be oh, yeah. um, you know ways of doing things that are not going to happen anymore, and that's going to impact the way people have to you know train to do their jobs. And you've got to be much more data literate these days. Um, yeah. You know, and then potentially has the potential to leave some people behind. But I fundamentally think that when we come out the other side, the advances and the benefits to society and to business are going to be significant. Um, and this is not new. This happens with waves of innovation across history. It's, oh, absolutely. This is I mean, yet another one. But you know, it's the different types of partnerships, like the work that we've done with the Mars family in terms of developing the cocoa beans for chocolate development, because there was going to be a disease that was going to kind of eradicate some of the um, crop development. I mean, looking at resource and water management, look at most of the urban populations where there isn't enough water usage and water, you know, there's a restriction here, even in San Jose, right? There's dry seasons and, and there's mm -hmm. different levels of pricing if you utilize and consume more than you're allocated. You think about rice grain development, you think about pollution, you think about transportation. I mean, huge, huge, huge macro global uh, problems that we can begin to solve using data and analytics in a completely different way. So, how cool is that? <laughs> well, great to see you on the queue. We're great to have you on there. I want to give you the final word. Your thoughts around traveling the world. I know you said you were on a, on a, on a world win oh, yeah. tour. What's your big takeaway from um, you know going to Israel, going to, to Asia, circling the globe? Yes. What are you seeing? Big picture, macro trends right now in the enterprise cloud. Uh, you know, big data, consumerization mm -hmm. of IT, mm -hmm. so Apple, iOS 8 yesterday have some nice enterprise BYOD kind of features. <laughs> I mean, I mean they're trying, right? Although Android's more buggy or some say, but <laughs> with all that going on, what are the big trends that you see? Um, probably three things. So first is, um, one that is huge is culture. So being much more analytic, data and analytic driven as an organization, so culture is one. Doesn't matter what country, doesn't matter what language you speak, it doesn't matter if it's a secular or non-secular <laughs> government institution, private institution. Um, second piece is um, investing in a platform that's much more current, leveraging capabilities like Hadoop, leveraging real-time context computing, real, you know, some advanced analytics around machine learning, but that is, you know, you really have to think about what is the next generation platform that's going to be ideal for your organization. And then the third is be serious about your investment into privacy and security. I mean, the, the amount of breaches, um, cyber attacks, but also the fraud aspects, it, it poses a whole different dimension that um, I would say in every country has come up very consistently. I mean, I understand it's like people will speak in a different language and all of a sudden I hear fraud or da da da, -da mm -hmm. cyber. <laughs> I mean, it's like, I, you know, those three things I can uh, understand. It's universal, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> well, thanks for coming on theCUBE. Great to see you. And again, so it's refreshing to see IBM really, you know, continuing its roots in open source. You guys have, you know, certainly in the generations going back, open source, been a great a participant and player. Um, and as we see in the Hadoop ecosystem, as, as uh, you know, Merv was saying, we were laughing about legacy, Hadoop will be the next buzzword. I forget the word legacy. you used. <laughs> the, the word you used this morning was, uh, uh, <laughs> you know, what was the word? It was, that wasn't legacy, that was what we're going to call it next year. But oh, he, okay. You don't of course remember. I'm drawing we a blank. It's the end of the day. Oh, now it's check, growing check up. The crowd chat, uh, check the crowd chat transcript. I'm sure it's on there somewhere. Check the crowd chat transcript. But okay. Hadoop is growing up. Business outcomes are being discussed. You're starting to hear the talk. It sounds like a market. It sounds like an immature oh, market. It's totally, You're hearing it's totally. TAM, revenue, market share. We're not there yet, but we're starting to get there. In Hichu, thank you for coming on theCUBE, IBM, Big Data. Here at Hadoop Summit, this is theCUBE. We'll be right back after this short break. <laughs>